right, so we've been cruising right along here with the reassembly. Pretty big milestone here. The whole block and bottom end is back together now. All the rods and pistons, as well as the timing assembly up here with the timing cover and all that. Even got the fan on right there. Um, and yeah, I mean, that's looking really, really sharp. So the next step is this crusty guy right here. Um, this is the head, of course. And I know you're gonna take one look at these camshafts and say, there's no way you're gonna be able to save those. And I don't have to because the camshafts from my other engine that I had a while ago are absolutely perfect. So I'm gonna use those camshafts. All I have to save from this is as much of the valve train as possible. Of course, I do still have the whole valve train from the engine those came from, but I think I'll be able to save quite a bit of this. So. We'll take this apart and start tearing that down. It's pretty much go through the same process as we did um, for the rest of the engine over there. So the head is all taken apart now, went pretty smoothly here, we got the whole valve train you know, organized over here. The only kind of problem we had on some of these was these, these tappets here that kind of sit in these bores right there. Um, they were kind of rusted, some of them had rust like on the sides and they were stuck in those bores there and they all have rust on the top as you can see. So it was tough getting some of those out, but we got them all out as you can see. But these are not gonna be usable here. Uh, I don't think I'll be able to clean up that top surface enough to make those usable. But that's okay, because in here, I have the entire valve train from the first engine I had, and all the tappets from that one are in fantastic condition. And they fit right in here, just like the other ones did. So, we're gonna use those from the first engine and probably all the valves and valve springs from this engine here. We're just taking a look at the valves too. They look pretty good. There's not much corrosion on them. I was looking at the valve surfaces there and um, it seems like it'll clean up pretty well. So yeah, that, that should work out pretty well. And we've got some valve lapping compound that we'll use to um, polish the valves to the seats again. So after we cleaned up the valves and the springs there as best as we could, I also took this little hone here and honed out these bores that those little cups ride in to actuate the valves. And then we also took some valve lapping compound to lap each one of the valves to its respective valve seat here, which worked out pretty well. And the manual that we were following here also shows this pretty hilarious picture of what they think clean valves look like even though it looks more like a UFO sighting. Um, but if you think your valves do need to be cleaned up a little bit, they're also nice enough to show you all the equipment you need to do that. But after we got finished lapping all the valves back in, I took the head outside and pressure washed it to make sure it was nice and clean. Then we used this homemade um, spring compressor to put the, the valves back in. And then on top of the valve stems, you can see I put this little round shim on top of each one. And then those little cups sit on top of that. And those shims are what actually set the valve lash for the camshafts here. So how you measure that is you install it just like that, torque the camshaft down, and then with some feeler gauges like we're doing right here, you can measure the, the gaps between the lobe of the camshaft and then and that, that cup that controls the valve. And that's supposed to be four thousandths for the intake and six thou for the exhaust on this engine but it's a very tedious process of setting the, the valves for this because you have to torque it down, measure all of them, and you can see we're writing down the, the number that they're at. And if that num number needs to be higher or lower, you take the camshaft back out, take those cups off, take the shims out, and install a different size shim, put it all back together, torque the camshaft down, and check it again. And after you do that with the intake side, 
you have to take the intake cam off again and then do the same on the exhaust side. Because if you leave one of the camshafts installed and then rotate the other one by itself, the valves will collide with each other and you'll bend the valve. But we went through that whole process and now you can see I have the intake installed back in and I'm torquing down the exhaust now using a pretty simple jig there to make sure that they're lined up 90 degrees to the surface of the, the cam cover seat. And then we can go back ahead and install the head. And so this here is the electronic oil sender unit to tell you your oil pressure, but I'm not going to be using this type of oil pressure gauge, so I'm just cutting this off and then I'm going to re-drill and thread this for just a pretty standard universal oil pressure gauge that we had laying around um, just for the purposes of this first test run here. So we got the flywheel back on, also installed the stock bell housing here to mount the starter to. And what we're doing now to prepare for the first start is priming the engine here. And this is a little oil priming kit that the local machine shop that I was working with was nice enough to let me borrow. And all this does is it's a pressurized vessel here that you fill up with oil, then pressurize with air, then you open a little valve there and the pressurized air pushes the oil up into the engine and throughout all the, the oil ways inside to make sure that there's it's filled with oil and ready to be started. If you don't do this, you run the risk of starting the engine dry and the oil not getting to bearing surfaces and stuff in time and you'll create a lot of wear at the beginning there. But that went pretty smoothly. We pumped all the oil in and then also just to be extra sure here, I took this little syringe and um, injected some more oil into the far ends of the camshafts here to make sure that there was plenty oil all throughout the system here. And one of the other big problems we had here though was the distributor and trying to get spark to the engine. Um, this distributor had been sitting outside for many months along with the engine and you can see it got pretty rusty inside. Um, and we spent, well, my dad spent the better part of a day completely dismantling that, cleaning it out the best we could. We didn't have any replacement parts and we didn't really have time to get any spare points or anything like that. So we were just hoping and praying that what we had worked. And we actually did end up getting spark with it here. You can't see it too well on video, but we were getting good spark from all six plugs. So that worked out pretty well. And then 
The other issue was that we still weren't able to get any oil pressure to read on the pressure gauge here as we were cranking the engine over just with the starter. But we decided to go ahead and decide to start it anyway and just run it for a couple seconds to see if we could build any oil pressure and also just to see if it'll start up. Let it run a little bit until it So not only did it fire up, but it did it on the first attempt, which was pretty awesome. But we still weren't seeing any oil pressure building, so I had to do some more troubleshooting here and decided to take off the oil filter housing here. And then what I was going to do is just crank over the engine a little bit to see if the pump was sending fluid to the actual oil filter. And you can see that, yes, clearly oil is reaching the oil filter housing here, but somehow still not building pressure up in the engine. So the next thing I checked was this relief valve that's on the bottom of the housing right there that normally connects to that hose to send fluid back into the sump if it reaches a certain pressure. And you can see here that when I crank it over again, oil just spills out of that. So that means oil was getting up into the filter housing, but not going into the rest of the engine. So what we decided to do was plug that up and crank it over again to see if that builds pressure. <laughs> so I guess that doesn't hold. It's not gonna hold that pressure. <laughs> So that faulty relief valve was clearly the problem there, uh, but the, instead of trying to fix it or replace it, we just took off the whole oil filter housing and swapped it out for the housing that I had from that first engine that I got a while ago. You can see it's a little bit different. The oil filter points up instead of down, uh, but we cranked that over and it was holding pressure right around 40 or 50 PSI. So that seemed to work out nicely. After that then, it was time to go for the first actual test start here. And I don't think I mentioned before, but the carburetors are actually from that first engine I had that I actually rebuilt myself probably a year and a half ago and have just had sitting around since then. So that's why the carburetors haven't been a focus of this video because they were already rebuilt. That's awesome. 
Well, how about that? It actually runs. This is my first time doing any sort of like engine work, I'd say. And like to take something like this com apart completely, you know, clean it up the best we could and then put it back together and for it to start and like fire up on the first attempt was pretty amazing. So driving car just got a lot more probable. You can see we've already been cooking through the list here of things that have to happen for that. In the next video, you can kind of see a little bit over here. I've, I've already started adapting. I've already started modifying my adapter plate here to fit the starter motor. So the next video you'll see that get done and the engine mounted in the car. Uh, so a running engine will be in the car for the first time ever, which is getting really, really exciting here. Uh, there are a couple little things you could tell that it was running pretty fast when I was when I started up there at the, at the end. It didn't seem like it had a nice low idle to it. And that was partially because, well, I think it was because there is a hole down here. You can see it's plugged up now with a hose and a plug on the end. But there's a hole down here in the bottom of the intake manifold that I'm not sure what that's for. This manifold was not from this specific engine block. It was from my, my old engine. And the, the manifold from this one still has like the same casting feature down here, but no hole there. So I just plugged it up. Of course, with that open, then the engine was getting a whole bunch of air from there. You know, I was bypassing the carburetors, so you couldn't really tune the carburetors with that there. But it clearly runs, so all like fine tuning and stuff like that can be done later with it in the car. Um, but yeah, this is this is getting really exciting. So thank you again for watching, and stay, definitely stay tuned.